Good morning. Good to have you with us again today. Life-changing. There's a lot of life-changing moments that we face, all of us together, you know, marriage and uh, uh, growing up, getting your license, all those kind of things. COVID this last year, elections change a nation, change who we are. So many things come into our life that are truly life-changing. There's nothing more life-changing than encountering what we see here in Revelation, seeing Jesus Christ. We are in the book of Revelation. Thank you for joining with us. We are seeing Jesus Christ all the way through. We get a glimpse of who he, who he was when he appeared to John for the first time. We get a glimpse of his love, his ministry, his grace to us, his church, to his church, churches there in Revelation. And now, now we see Jesus Christ in a heavenly throne room. There he is. Things that are going to happen. Things that are going to take place. Before that takes place, we see Jesus Christ right here. Chapter 5, we've seen, chapter 4, we've seen the, the Father. God the Father, He is the focus. He is worthy. He is worthy of all praise and all honor. Now in chapter 5, our focus is on Jesus Christ. He is worthy of all praise, of all honor, of all glory. We're going to see that this morning. A glimpse of Jesus Christ truly from the Word of God is life-changing. What's about to unfold in Revelation is true. It is real. It's going to take place. There will be, there will be uh, the work of Jesus Christ, the wrath of God, the deliverance of God, beautiful things, terrible things, all unfolding. It'll be God's handiwork. His fingerprints are all over it. Before that takes place, we catch another glimpse of Jesus Christ. He is worthy. He is the Lion of Judah we saw last week. This morning we're going to see another glimpse, which really becomes the focus of this chapter 5. Uh, it is a prequel to what's coming, to what's to unfold. But let's stop. Let's look at this chapter. Let's see what, he, what God has for us this morning. Let's look at Christ. Let's realize that who he is is truly life-changing for you and for I, not only for the future, but for right now. Our relationship with him is the most important thing. Your relationship with him right now is the most important thing. He is worthy. These two chapters are a, a defense of God. It is, it is a justification for what God's about to do. He doesn't need to be justified before us. He doesn't need to defend himself before us. He chooses to show us this important material so that we can understand, we can see just a little bit, we can have a glimpse into who God is, what he's doing, and why he's doing it, and what it means. Last week we looked at Jesus Christ. He is worthy because he's one with the Father. He is worthy because he fulfills the will of the Father. We saw that right here. He is worthy because he is the fulfillment of all prophecy. That's the first five verses that we saw here in chapter 5. And then we we closed with number four, and that's what's going to unfold this morning. This last point is going to take us all the way through this morning. Jesus Christ is worthy. He is worthy to do what he's about to do. He's worthy of all praise, of all worship, of all honor, because, number four, he has overcome. He is an overcomer. I mean, the, the main emphasis of the seven letters to the seven churches in chapters two and three were that they would be overcomers, that they would look to Christ, that we would look to Christ the emphasis was that believers, that we would look to Jesus Christ and because of his enablement, his power, his testimony, his promises, the hope that we have in him, that we would also be overcomers like he is. He has overcome. That is critical. That is crucial here. So let's pick that up. Let's see that. Understand what he has to say. Okay. Verse 6, verse 9, verse 11. Let's begin. And between the throne... And the four living creatures, and among the creatures, well, see, here we have in uh, verse 5, he speaks of the Lion of Judah. He turns around, and what does he see? Not a lion, he sees the Lamb of God. And I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain. In verse 9, we see this, for you were slain. In verse 12, we see this, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. He has overcome how did he do that? He is worthy because he was slain. He was slain for you and I. He gave his life for you and I. He is an overcomer. He overcame the greatest battle, the greatest hurdles, the spiritual warfare, the greatest that has ever been faced. He gave his life for us. It was costly. Romans shows us this. The scriptures show us this. Romans chapter 5, just in brief, it just shows us this. He gave us life. He died for the ungodly. He died for us. We are saved by his life. The beautiful thing, the amazing thing, the life-changing thing is this. He did all of this while we were what? While we were weak. That means we were unable. We had no strength to do what we needed to do. We were sinners. 
We were tainted, everything that we did, even our good, is tainted by sin. We were enemies, enemies of God. The very nature of our heart, the very nature of our life that we are born with, puts us at odds with God. All these things define the unbeliever. All these things define us when we are born into this world. Only Jesus Christ can break those barriers down. Only Jesus Christ can penetrate through those barriers and reach our heart, touch our heart, and change our life. He gave his life for you and I. He overcame because he was slain. There was a, there was a sin problem because of Adam and Eve. There was only one who could deal with that. There was only one who could, who could address the sin that wrecked havoc and chaos in humanity on this earth, in this universe, it was Jesus Christ. Because he is who we see here, the, the spotless, the perfect Lamb of God. He was slain for you and I. They struck him, they mocked him, they crucified him, they killed him, they murdered him. He gave his life freely though for you and for I. How important that is. Another thing that we see here as well is that he revealed a divine love. When he, when he gave his life, when he gave his life up for you and I, what he did is he revealed how much God loves us. He revealed how much he loves us. That, that act of sacrificial giving was an act of divine love for us. Ephesians chapter 2 tells us it is God's love. It is a divine love. It's not from us. We can't love like this without knowing God. He was rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us. And he made us alive in Christ, with Christ, it's through Christ, through his death, his burial, his resurrection. Through faith in him, we have life. It is the love of Jesus Christ that was poured out on us. Also look at verse 6. What we see as well is this. We see another description as we continue, this lamb, this lamb of God who was slain, who gave his life. With seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent into all the earth, so he, he was slain, but this lamb was one who was described in terms that we see right here. What we see here in, in the first description is seven horns. It reveals really the omnipotence of God. It reveals all power. It reveals uh, the very power of God. We could go to a lot of verses, but I want to look at these three elements, and I want to look, that, and look at them thr uh, through and from the life of Jesus Christ when he was here on earth. Not what we see before or after when he's, as he's in heaven now. Luke chapter 9, he calls the twelve together. He gives them power. He gives them authority over all the demons to cure diseases. That's what he does. Matthew tells us also to the twelve, he gave them the ability to cast out those those evil spirits, and to heal every disease. He gave them power that they didn't have. He is all-powerful. He is omnipotent. We see just a glimpse of that. Yes, he set aside uh, the, the glory of God, the visible glory of God when he came. He set aside the, the daily visible uh, expression of the attributes of God, yet they still resided within him. He was, he was all-powerful, even as the Lord Jesus Christ here on earth. Just a glimpse of that we see here. He gave the disciples everything they needed to succeed and be successful. When they failed, it wasn't his fault. It was, it was a lack of faith on their part. He gave them the ability to, to have strength over, the, over demons, demonic warfare. They had the ability to win that warfare, that battle, by faith through Jesus Christ right here. To heal any disease, all diseases that they might encounter. That is power. That is just a, a, a glimpse in his earthly ministry of his omnipotent na nature. We also see here in, in uh, verse 6, not only does he have the seven horns, this this because seven is, again, that number of completeness. Everything is completed, that is good, is completed in God, in Christ here. And so it is a, it is a picture of the complete whole attribute that is found in Jesus Christ omnipotence. He also not only has seven horns, he has seven eyes. We see this. It's reflecting, revealing his omniscience. Nathaniel, when he was called to Jesus as a disciple, how do you know me? When he first saw Jesus, and Jesus answered, before Philip called you, told you about me, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. He wasn't even there physically, but he saw, he knew, he understood. Nathaniel understood what he was saying. Matthew, he said to the Pharisees, this is 
Knowing their thoughts, he answered, he said to them. He, it's a narrative comment there. It shows us that Jesus Christ, sometimes we think, well, I know what you're thinking. Here he did know their thoughts. He knew exactly what they were thinking. He didn't just guess. He knew he understood. The disciples themselves, John 16, 30. Now we know that you know all things. And we do not need anyone to question you. That is why we believe that you came from God. They, they see a glimpse of the omniscience of Jesus Christ, of God, in his earthly ministry, just a, just a small glimpse of what is true of him that he is, that is uh, veiled within him. And from time to time, he gives the disciples, the world, a glimpse of this. Also, we see here in verse uh, 6, and there are seven spirits. These seven eyes are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. We see the spirits of God are the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit of, of Christ in us. It is the omnipresence of God. We see in John chapter 3, no one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven. God is, Jesus was from heaven. He, that's his home, his abode, his dwelling place. That's where he came from. No human can say that. Matthew chapter 18, in his earthly ministry, he says, we, we use this verse all the time, where two or three are gathered in my name. What does he say? There I am what? I am with them. I am among them. Jesus said that in his earthly ministry, wherever you are at, two or three are gathered. Now, this is, this is, this is uh, the context here is, is discipline, but it's true of any believers as we gather to pray. What does Jesus say? Omnipotence. I am there. In spirit and in character, by the Spirit of God. So we see these reflections of Jesus, who Jesus Christ is. Divine attributes, divine expressions. We could go into these in detail. But we're getting a glimpse of that reality in the Lamb of God who is standing there before the throne. How important. He is worthy because... He overcame. He gave his life. He was slain. Now, also in verse 6, we see this. Let's look. We have all these attributes, these seven horns, these seven eyes, these seven spirits, omnipotence, omniscience, omnipresence of God, all these things. But what is also true of Jesus Christ? He gave these things, and we've, we've mentioned he set them aside. He humbled himself. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. He emptied himself. He humbled himself. He set aside those visible manifestations of those attributes. While, while they were still with him, a part of him, accessible to him, they were not visible daily, minute by minute, to a world who watched him because they were veiled from, from humanity on the large part. The very glory of God. Only a few saw that on the Mount of Transfiguration, etc. He emptied himself. He became nothing. He set aside those things. The reputation that's, that's fully his, that we see here in Revelation 5, he set that aside. That glory he set aside, he came down as a servant in humility. He humbled himself. He became obedient to the death, death of the cross. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. He, even for a, a time, made himself a little lower than the angels who are here in this setting. What are they doing in Revelation 4 and 5? They're bowing before him. They're worshiping him here in Revelation. And he suffered death. He tasted death for everyone. He humbled himself. Folks, we don't talk about humility enough in our life and in our testimony. We don't teach our kids humility. We put them out there all the time. We post about them and we and we and we sing their praises. And we need to we need to teach them a humble heart, a servant's heart. The Lord Jesus Christ, who had everything and was everything, in here in Revelation five is being exalted above all. Humbled himself. We need to learn from him. He humbled himself. You see, here's what he did. In humility, he became what we are. He became nothing. He set aside everything that defined him and became a servant. Servant. It reminds us of who we are and what we are in our sin. Galatians 6.3, If anyone thinks that he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Before God, in our sin, we are nothing. John 14.6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. That's humility. There's not one person that has enough of anything to be able to gain access to heaven. Enough wealth, enough riches, enough holiness, enough righteousness, enough anything. There's not, there's not one person who has ever lived who has enough to gain entrance into the heaven, into the 
heaven in, in, into a relationship with God. That's, that's humbling. We must humble ourselves when we come to the cross and understand that and realize that. It's by grace we've been saved through faith. It's not of our own doing. Salvation is not of our own doing. We didn't save ourselves by works, by our own righteousness, by our own goodness. Nothing in us was worthy to put us in a position where we would be accepted and gain the favor of God. We are nothing before him because of sin. Jesus reminds the believer, us, apart from him, we can do nothing. Jesus became nothing, literally. He became a servant. He died as a servant for you and I. He calls us to be the same and to recognize the same thing in our life. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. His poverty became our riches. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich for your sake, he became poor. So that you by his poverty might become rich. We have everything because of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.21 The Father made Christ, made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He, we become everything. When we, when we receive Jesus Christ as Savior by faith and step into a relationship with the Heavenly Father, we are given everything. We are given relationship. We are bankrupt before that moment of profession of faith, before that moment of, of receiving Christ, of relationship, and then we are given everything. What promise, what beauty you see here. He is worthy. He is worthy. He overcame. He was slain. He humbled himself. Look at verse 9. And we see this as well. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God. He paid our debt. He redeemed us. He ransomed people. That's what he did. He, we had a debt. We couldn't pay. Sin was a, put us in bondage. We couldn't pay our debt to get out of bondage, to gain our freedom, he paid our debt. He paid our debt. He gave us life. He gave us freedom. That's what he did. Matthew chapter 20 reminds us that's why he came. The Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom, as a, as a payment, as a price for the, for the penalty of sin. He came to give his life as that payment, as that price for sin. He satisfied the price. He made the payment. God was satisfied. Salvation was secured and provided and enabled. He is our provider. He is our Savior. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 18. We were ransomed from our feudal ways. We were nothing. We couldn't pay that price. Everything that we might try to do to gain relationship with God is futile. Those things we inherited from, our, our, from sin, from our parents, that's sin nature, we can't, we can't purchase our way. We can't ransom our way. We can't buy our way, not with perishable things, not with silver, not with gold. We are saved. We gain relationship. Our sin is forgiven through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's that Lamb of God without spot or blemish who is here in Revelation 5. He took our place. He made the payment. He loved us. The fruit of that is, is His grace, His love. In Him, in Christ, we have redemption. Through His blood, the forgiveness of our sins, of our trespasses according to the riches of His grace. I tell you what, this is a worship passage. It's all about what Jesus Christ has done for us and the reason that He is lifted up as worthy, not only to be praised and worshiped, but worthy to carry out the wrath of God against man because He has given every man, every woman, every child an opportunity to know Him. In various ways, He has made the message of the truth of the gospel known so that every man is without excuse. What beauty that is. It's up to man to receive. It's up to man to acknowledge. It's up to us to say, there's nothing I can do to gain relationship. I have nothing to bring. God, I, I rely 100% on you. And I confess my weakness and my sin. I confess my inability. And I ask you to be my Savior. I ask you to take my place. I ask you to give me life. That's what he did here. And when that happens, it's grace and it's love. How beautiful that is. He paid our debt. He gave us life. That's what he did. And so the result of that is this. The implication of that is in 1 Corinthians 6.20. You were bought with a price. He paid the price. Only he could pay that price. 
You know, I love a lot of people who have been significant in my life, but none of them could do what he did. The people that you love that have had the biggest impact on your life couldn't do what he did. He paid the price. And so here's what he calls us to do. That we, are, we are to honor him. We're to glorify God with our body, our mind, our soul, our strength, with all that we are. We're to honor God with everything. That's the response that God wants you to have. It's the response God wants me to have with our very life. We continue to give back to him the rest of our life because of what he did for us. He freed us from bondage. Sin is bondage. Sin, sin is a problem in our life our whole time here on earth. We struggle with sin yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And yet he has overcome. He gives us the ability to overcome. Spiritually, relationship with God the Father, he has given us the ability to overcome sin by relationship with him. What's the result of all these things? What's the result of what he's done? Who he's being lifted up here for? His work on our behalf. What's the result of that? Let's see that. Look at verse 10. So because of all that, you have ransomed, verse 9, uh, people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. He's redeemed us. How, how this will come to full expression during the tribulation. And you have, verse 10, you've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. What's the result of his work? The Lamb of God going to the cross, the Lamb of God overcoming sin, winning the spiritual battle against sin, against Satan, against the enemy, against evil. What's the result of that? What's the promise of that? What, is God, what does God promise to us because of that work, because of relationship in Christ? He's promised. He has given us a kingdom. We see that here in verse 10. And you have made them a kingdom. You've made them a kingdom. Every believer is a part of something bigger than themselves. We are a part of something greater than ourselves, of a future that's greater than ourselves. We go back to Daniel. Daniel has a lot to do with Revelation. We are set apart. The saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, forever, and ever. Here's a glimpse of, God, of, of four kingdoms who will be utterly smashed ultimately by God, the fifth kingdom. He will overcome. And all of those who are a child of God will be a part of this final kingdom, which here in Revelation is about to take place. And we who are children of God will receive this kingdom. It is certain. Verse 22, Until the Ancient of Days came, judgment was given for the saints of the Most High, and the time came when the saints possessed the kingdom of God. It's written as though it's already taking place. That's how certain it is. We see that often in in the scriptures where God writes about something that's yet to take place as though it's already happened. That's how certain the truth of God's word. That's how certain the promises of God are. Chapter 7, verse 27. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. It's going to be everlasting, and we will serve and obey him. It is coming here in Revelation. It is the millennial kingdom which turns into the eternal kingdom. It is coming. It is as certain as though it took place, as we see here in Daniel, and yet it's going to take place with absolute certainty. His expression, this promise of the kingdom of God, is an expression again of what? Of his love. Do you know he loves you so much that he's promised you this? He's promised the child of God, this, how beautiful that is, James 2, 5. Listen, you who are loved so much, brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world, that's economically and spiritually, to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom? Also in verse 10, another result is this, what? Not only has he made us a kingdom, he's made us priests to God. That's significant. How important in the Old Testament it was priests who, who stood between the people and God, who offered sacrifices between the people and God. Now he says to all of us, we are defined by the very role of being a priest before God. He has given us privilege. Privilege, privilege. Access to him. That's what the priesthood of the believer is all about. To Israel, he said in Exodus, you shall, Israel, you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. Has that happened yet? No. Is that going to happen? You better believe it. It's coming. Here at the end of the tribulation, Israel is going to be brought into 
they're going to experience the full blessing of this promise right here. They will become a nation of priests, a nation that is holy, a nation that will never be under bondage again, a nation, a nation who is finally in relationship with God as they should have been all along. To believers, he says this in the New Testament, you yourselves are like living stones. You and I are being built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. We have access. We can serve him, offer sacrifice, be a living sacrifice before him, Romans 12, 1 or 2. We can be what God wants us to be. We can be pleasing to him as we live. We can have a relationship with him. Right now, you can talk to him in prayer. You can go to him today for power, for strength, for wisdom, for grace. That's, that's the truth the reality of the priesthood of the believer. Priesthood is relationship. Relationship is access. Roman Revelation 20. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ. If I know Jesus Christ, if I am taken to heaven and, and the Lord takes my life and I go home to be with him when the re first resurrection comes, my body will be reunited with my soul and I will be together with him for all time. That, that first resurrection can't harm me. That second death can't harm me, by the way. I mean, the second death can't harm me. There's a death coming, a spiritual death coming for those who don't know Jesus Christ. That has nothing to do with us. For we will be and have been resurrected to life. Because of why? Because of our priesthood. Because we are in relationship with Jesus Christ. Also, we see in verse 10 another description. Not only has he made us a kingdom and priests to our God, but he's promised to us that, that we, that they, that all of us shall reign on the earth. We're going to reign with him. He's given us opportunity. That opportunity is to rule and to reign with Jesus Christ. Revelation 2, 26. Here to, to the church, the literal church, the one who conquers, overcomes, who keeps my word until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. They will rule, they will reign over the nations. Revelation 26, this is, this is going to be fulfilled. They will reign with him for a thousand years. A literal kingdom under the reign of Jesus Christ. What that looks like into all eternity, we can only imagine. But we know for these thousand years, we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ here. That's beautiful. There's something even more than that. That's, that's the reward. The reward is God's promise to give us a kingdom, uh, to give us the ability to reign and to rule with him. Uh, we, uh, how can, how, the, to be able, the ability to describe that uh, eludes us because we don't have the details. We don't know what that's going to look like, but we are going to rule and reign with him. How we have served him here is going to be reflected in the opportunities we have then. We know that. Revelation 4.10. The 24 elders, they fall down before the Father who is seated on the throne. They worship him. They live the one who lives forever and ever. <clears throat> Here's what happens. They take their crowns. They take all that has been given to them by Christ. And they lay it back before him in worship. You know, God's, God has promised that the beam of seed, he's going to reward all believers. That's encouraging. We're going to be accountable, but we're going to receive reward. To every believer, he's promised, I'm going to reward you for your faithfulness, for serving me. But you know what? All those things, all those rewards, whatever they're going to be, we're going to, we're going to lay them back at his feet. Because the most important thing if God never rewarded us with those tangible things, the greatest reward is this. It's relationship. It's that you and I know Jesus Christ. It's being, it's being forever in his presence for all eternity. And, and the joy of that and the joy of what that means. But the, but the riches of that relationship are, are exponentially uh, beyond description as he rewards us for in his love and his grace and his faithfulness for the way we have served him and for relationship that we have. Relationship is the key. The reward is the icing on the cake. The reward is we love cake. We love the icing. We love all that. But it happens because we first know Jesus Christ. I trust you know him this morning. Jesus Christ, he's our... Because Revelation starts with this truth. This is how Revelation starts. Jesus Christ, he's the faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. He overcame. He was slain. He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. We're going to rule and reign with him here. He loves us. He freed us. He's our redeemer from our sins by his blood. He made us a kingdom. He made us priests to God and the Father. To him what? Be glory and dominion forever and ever. He's worthy. You know, we can't read we can't read these two passages and not see that God is worthy. The Father, the Son.
This is the whole conclusion that the word of God comes to. He is worthy. To God be the glory for all that he has done. This is the conclusion of these two passages. Passages. He is worthy. Okay, let's look at verse 5, verse 7. So what is he worthy to do? Oh, verse 5. Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Verse 7, and he went, and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. He is worthy to open the scroll. He's worthy to open its seven seals. Isn't that beautiful? The most beautiful thing. You have the scroll, which is, which is the will of God. It's, it's the wrath of God. It's the title deed to, to the earth and to, and to the eternal kingdom. And it's all these things. There's only one who is able to open that. It's God himself in the person of Jesus Christ. And Jesus steps forward, and he is worthy to open the scroll. Why? Because of what we've seen already this morning in, in this passage. He's worthy to open the scroll. He's worthy to unveil everything that's contained within. He's worthy to apply it uh, to history. He's worthy to be the one to be worshipped and adored. He is worthy of all things. It's interesting here, as he comes in verse 7, he went and he took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. He doesn't ask to take it. He doesn't bow before the Father. Um, there, there is no way in which he is subservient to the Father here. He is an equal with the Father. We're going to see that. He opens the scroll and its seven seals. That's what he does. Um, he is worthy, Jesus Christ, because of his work on the cross, because he was God for all eternity, who stepped into humanity in the flesh, became our Savior. He is worthy. He is God who loved us perfectly with grace and love. He is worthy to take that scroll, because he is God, to open that scroll and to release its contents upon our future history. That's who he is. Not only that, look at verse 8. Verse 9, when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Each were holding a harp and a golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Verse 11, and then I looked, and around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was what? Slain. To receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. He is worthy to be worshipped and praised. All creation here is bowing before Him. The angels, the four living creatures, they are all honoring Him, lifting Him up, exalting Him. Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, the one who is standing there, the one who took the scroll. Remember, John is weeping because no one can open the scroll, and the weeping turns to joy. The weeping turns to praise as Jesus takes that scroll, as he completes the work, as he is God himself fulfilling the promises of the Word of God. They are now being fulfilled. That's joyful. And Jesus Christ is honored with words that are, that are beyond comprehension. This is who he is. The one who, he's here not as, the, not as one who was on a cross. He's here not in a manger. He's here not in the grave. He's here as King of kings, as Lord of lords. We're going to see at the end of Revelation, he is here to be worthy to be exalted. This is who Jesus Christ is. This is the promise. He is worthy to be worshipped and praised. Even the very prayers of the saints, the bowls of incense here, the very prayers are lifted up. This, the act of praying is worship. The act of praying is, is, is uh, incense that is captured by God as, as valuable and precious. And he, and he cherishes when you and I talk to him in prayer and are in relationship. Just as the priests offered up incense, acknowledging his worthiness, we offer a prayer and it is worship before him. And all creation here is worshiping him. Thousands upon thousands, innumerable angels are before him singing his praises. And then in verse 13, we see this as well. In 14, and I heard every creature in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and they worshipped. 
He is worthy to be fully equated with the Father. He is God. There, there is there is no sin here. There's no blasphemy here. The Father and the Son are as one, worshipped and praised and exalted and recognized as divine, as God. One God, three persons, the Spirit of God, His fingerprints, His person, His presence is all over these two chapters. Here we have God being worshipped in His fullness, in His essence. Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, is the Lamb of God, who in the very presence of the Father is exalted as the Father is and was, and is worshipped and adored. These two chapters just bring us to the place that God wants us to worship Him, the Father and the Son. We are created expressly for the purpose of worshiping God, of treasuring God above all else, of treasuring Jesus Christ more than anything else in my life, more than, than other people in my life, more than other things that I might have and own, mother, mother, other than experience, more than experiences, opportunities, whatever that might be. I am to treasure Jesus Christ above all things. Every day when I wake up, I have to ask this question. Is he worthy to be worshipped? You know, you think, that's a strange thing. Of course I believe that. I'm a child of God. I'm a believer. But you know what? That's a good question to ask. Is he worthy of this? Is he worthy today for me to follow him in obedience? Is he worthy today for me to yield to him so that I might overcome sin? Is he worthy that he might be number one in my life today? Is he worthy that he, that, that he might have control of my priorities, my goals, my choices, my calendar, my relationships, my people. Is he worthy enough that he deserves to have authority over all of those things? Control over all those things? Is he worthy to be worshipped? Is he worthy today that I might treasure him above all else? Every day that you wake up, every day that I wake up, I'm at, we're asked that question. It's laid before us. What will we do with the identity that we have in Jesus Christ. What will we do with our relationship with Jesus Christ? Will we exalt Him? Will we declare to a world that is watching us that He is worthy? Will we make good choices? Will we be committed to purity and integrity? Will we be committed to going and sharing Jesus Christ? Will we be committed to, to becoming disciples and growing in Jesus Christ? Are we committed to that because He's worthy? Will we give Him our heart and let him, let him look into every corner of our life because he's worthy? Is he worthy? That's a good question that we must ask ourselves. As we close this morning, I just want to challenge you, give you an opportunity when you, when you step away from the sermon to just have a moment of thought and reflection, meditation, of praise, of just saying, God, this is who you are in my life. I pray that this is who you are in my life, that you would simply be worthy in every way in my life and receive honor and glory. A song entitled, Is He Worthy? It's a beautiful song. You can, you can Google this. You can type in, Is He Worthy? Lyrics by, either by Andrew Peterson or Chris Tomlin on YouTube. And you can see a video there where the song will be played. The lyrics will be in front of you. You can, you can, you can worship, sing along. I encourage you to do that. May the Lord just touch your heart and bring you into His presence. Might you just treasure Him and honor Him and love Him and worship Him. Yield to Him and say, Lord, I'm not here. By Your love and grace, would You bring me to this place? Would You help me to let go of the things in my life that are keeping me from treasuring You like this? I have to pray that. I, I, can't, I can't preach this without being honest before You and saying, this is a need of my life as well. I need to practice this every day. And let go. And honor God and worship Him. May He help us together to do that for His glory. If you're listening, just all God's people, we say what? Amen. That's our prayer this morning. Thank you for joining with us. We'll come back again. We'll continue. We'll grow. We'll be changed because we're looking at Christ. May He touch your heart and your life this morning. Thank you for being with us.